Okay, so my name is Ravi Shankar Burgaukar. Uh, I work in uh, mobile communication since last uh, 10 years almost. Since I started to do my master's studies, it was still telco. So it's been long period uh, that I'm working with telco protocol stacks and networks as well. And then uh, I have with me Altaf. Uh, he is currently in, in Germany, TU Berlin, where he's doing a PhD, uh, about to finish. Uh, he will tell more about uh, him. And this is a talk. Uh, so partly we also presented in Black Hat. So how many people were in Black Hat? So I don't know if you've seen this uh, or not. So uh, so uh, up to you if you want to repeat. But I think uh, we, we got a feedback that uh, we only talk about the 5G radio protocols that we've been actively working on, 4G and 5G specification, because that has been frozen. And, and that's, that's been what we're going to see on the market now. Uh, and and uh, this is what we've been doing, and this is uh, the main area. But many people wanted to also see what the 5G uh, security is about, what people are talking about, some countries are being banned, or some vendors are being banned, what uh, controversy is going on. So we thought we add uh, some 15, 20 minutes on that part to explain what the 5G transition is about. And, and then we come back to the 5G radio protocols attack, that's what we present. So how many people really know uh, 5G in detail, or, or let's say they heard of something, they know what in, inside looks like, or 4G at least, how many people know in the room? Don't be shy, I'm not going to say that you work for operator, but you just if you know, if you can just say yes or no, okay. It's very few people. So uh, I'm not going in detail, but I just try to explain you what this 5G or type C is rather than. Rather than, uh, rather than saying uh, what 5G is, I'm not really going to say 5G has a high speed internet or a low latency, you can do remote surgery, what people say about use case of 5G, that's everybody's talking. But I will just try technically what this 5G means. So, so we're going to get two types of 5G uh, in the Europe right now. So this is basically, uh, you have a 4G infrastructure that is being everywhere in Europe or all over the world. And basically, people will just deploy 5G base station, and they will hook those base station to the existing 4G core network. And that's like one type of 5G that we are already seeing now everywhere. You are hearing that some, con some companies are trying pilot project, or, or in Asia, they have launched the 5G network, also in Sweden, for example. So this is like this kind of network we have. So it's just a 5G base station. Uh, we have a 5G base stations. And they are connected to the 4G, and that's what we call uh, non-standalone mode network. This is what we're going to see nowadays. But this has no problem, because what you are hearing the controversy about, this is not about this network, OK? Because this is quite, people believe that they safe and it's under control of mobile operators. But people are afraid or making so much complications. is about this second type of network, which really has the unique feature of 5G which is basically a low latency, where you have a high speed network, high, higher than what we have with this first type of 5G. And this is basically, you will have a 5G base stations which are attached with a real 5G core network. This is called 5G standalone network. And this is what people are afraid of or are talking about how, what we should do or how should we deploy this network. So this is like a mixed complication. And, and what, we, what I try to uh, give some hint about what is the problem with this second type of network and why people are having some controversies along this, right? OK. Uh, first of all, I mean, uh, why 5G is really important? This is just a point I wanted to highlight to you. So j roughly, what is the average fiber, uh, the broadband speed you get, at, you get at your house? So let's assume that it's 100 Mbps, something, right? I, I, I say average, right? So you may be getting 1 Gbps with the fiber, uh, fiber to home or something like this. But the point is, if 5G is about to give you 1 Gbps wireless speed, would you dig, start to dig the ground? Or, or can I imagine after 10 years when I buy a TV, it will come with the embedded SIM card and I don't need to plug any cable to my TV and it will just work wirelessly. You just hook the power and that's it. So you don't need to put any cable, modem, anything like this. Because you have 1 Gbps speed, which you pay, let's say, 50 euro per, per month or something like with the plan, unlimited data. So people will not have a cable to any IoT device or any smart, any smart device which you deploy in the house. So this may happen. So what the point is basically, then we are talking about a network which will carry all the device uh, data through the mobile network. 
So, so most of the devices, I mean, already we are using mobile network for many purposes, right? So how many, you, you use mo your mobile for many services, right? Nowadays, at least banking, your, you check your business email or many things like this. And now we're gonna increase more and this, that, that, that says that 5G will, after 10 years, may become a national critical infrastructure itself. So it will carry more data than even what we carry over the broadband connection right now, even enterprise business as well. So that makes situation complicated that every, every data is being transmitted over this network. Now what's the problem with this network or this, uh, this architecture in, in that scenario, right? So just to briefly explain, so I just explained this no, in a normal figure uh, and what's the problem is. So what you see on the left side is basically we call radio access network. That's the technical term we, we call in net, mobile networks. So this is like every network you can divide in this category, okay? So left side you have a mobile phone and a base station. So everybody has a mobile phone. Then you see mobile base stations on buildings or, or somewhere. And that whole block is called radio access network, okay? And that is common in every mobile network, even in 5G. Okay, that's not going to change, and that's what we have first type of 5G. And the second block is what we call, we call core network. And this is basically a closed warden. Why I, why I put this green symbol? Because if you want to hack into this infrastructure, it's not that easy, because it's not connected to internet straight ahead. Of course, there are some exceptions, but still, this is quite closed border. So if I need to access this one, I just need to send some guy or I just need to break some building and get access to this, for example, because this is still closed warden until 4G, okay? And, and this is what I wanted to explain, so what exactly changed? And now when we come to 5G, things have been changed now. So what you see this block diagram, this is the standard di diagram which has been finalized by the 3GPP, the, the entity which designed the 5G architecture. So this is the exact figure we have been uh, discussed and, and this will be shaping uh, all the 5G core networks. But what is interesting, I'm not gonna explain you all the point, but I just want to tell you two key differences here, really two important. When people were designing these standards, they were thinking of, because everybody talks about, okay, tell me where the encryption starts and ends, because that's what you wanted to know, whether this architecture has end-to-end -end security or not. And when people started to design the protocol, that was also a hot topic. So where should be our ending, encryption ending point? So if I ask you people, uh, when you make a mobile phone call, you do many times or you use internet. Do you know where your encryption ends when you make a call on 4G? Do you know, anybody know in the room? Let's say your encryption starts from your mobile phone and do you know where it ends? I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about SSL or application level. I'm just talking about call specific. BTS. Yeah, BTS, so this guy is correct, 4G. How about, how about 3G? Okay, I, I tell you, in 2G, encryption ends on base station. In 4G, ends on base station. In 3G, it never ends on base station. It ends on radio network controller. That's a, another hop, which you no longer have access. And in 5G, lots of debate happen, and, and again, encryption is ending on base station. So if you compare encryption to ending point, 3G is the best technology you had so far, and which we are about to kill because encryption ends on radio network core controller there. And here as well, what you see on the left side, it's a, it's a UE means mobile phone, and, and then you have UE, your mobile phone SIM card. So encryption starts from there, it's end on the G node B, that's called base station. Okay, there are some caveats, they have done some smart trick there to prevent that somebody can compromise base station and can intercept calls, for example, or channels. Uh, and, and basically, it ends on a base station, but from there, there is encryption as well. It's not like there is no encryption, but there is encryption, uh, which can be IPsec tunnel, for example, which goes to the core network. And uh, it's a mandatory, sometimes optional, but if you can ask to any of your operator friend, or if, if you have a friend who works in mobile company, do you really use those tunnels or not IPsec? Many people say, no, we don't use it because we believe that it's our own network. We don't care about putting IPsec tunnel or anything. So it's a plain text sometimes within the network. But of course, when you have a small base station, of course, you have IPsec uh, encryption there. And the rest of the blocks are, there is a funny thing about the rest of the block. So right now in 4G, the similar kind of a core network, we have a dedicated IT hardware for each and every block of this component of a network. But in 5G, those blocks, I mean, each of every block can be a cloud network. So we deploy all these blocks in the cloud. And this is what the 5G architecture is called service space architecture. And it uses REST-based Java APIs to deliver new services, create new APIs. So it's basically they are trying to integrate 
all the IT or in internet kind of architecture into this uh, mechanism right now. And this, this makes things a little bit complicated, and I try to explain again uh, which scenario. So this 5G core network has been transferred. So this is the biggest change in 5G core network, and this is what people are afraid of something. And, and why it's problematic? Because it it's uses different disciplines of uh, IT. And, and disciplines are basically, it uses cloud computing, it uses programmable network, it also uses mobile edge computing, network function virtualization, like SDN and many things. And uh, every technology has its own security issues. And now all this has to be tackled when you deploy 5G network. And if I tell you now, if I build those blocks, and if I look at the architecture, there is one element they have to trust, hypervisor. So can you imagine now you have to trust your hypervisor completely in order to provide all these kind of security principles on 5G core network. And I'm not saying hypervisor is the best thing, but how many people really trust the hypervisor when they deploy something with, with, with the hypervisor architecture? Do you really trust the hypervisor? So th this is like a, a different area which we are uh, heading forwards. And, and again, this is also a kind of ex difference I try to say. Uh, so if I compare with existing architecture and now with the new architecture, we have a less separated of core network and, and radio network, radio network uh, controller, then all the softwares and hardware are basically it just you run the bare metal. It could be a data center, and then you run all the building blocks on data centers. And the funny thing is, how many people know SS7 attacks? SS7 attacks been in telco. I think Belgium must be knowing many things about those as well. Uh, so SS7 was really a signaling protocol, which is still being used in until 4G. And it has been shown that this has been used by various entities to hack even SMS OTPs as well. Uh, I mean, they, they not only track people, but you, they can also hack your uh, SMS OTP, even get encrypted calls as well. And now 5G decided that we're not going to use SS7, but we will use the web-based protocol. Uh, and this will be web-based signaling protocol protected over HTTP, TLS, and all the certificate-based mechanism. It's a good thing. But at the same time, it's a challenging. So every two operators will be interconnected with them with using some REST-based Java APIs protected over SSL and TLS, for example. So we are coming towards adopting the all internet standards. And now we have to rely on certificate managements and everything for, for those core network. It's a good, good approach, but it has to be pr properly configured in that scenario. OK, so what exactly makes this situation complicated? So what exactly we have, we'll have a uh, increased attack surface? Many people say it's, it's increasing attack surface, but what exactly that means, right? On the radio level side, it, it's fine. It's quite obvious. You still have a, a radio channel. It means it, this can be attacked, even though you have encrypted. You have a jamming attacks, right? And, and the one point is from the 5G architecture, this is also I see from last couple of years I, I'm doing research as well. So when we design these standards, uh, let's assume that if I give you a challenge, let's design a protocol, and you have a mobile phone, and you have a base station, and now you wanted to establish some kind of secure channel. So how do you design? And, and, and during the design phase, what people said that they always give the higher power or higher authority to the base station. So base station is master and your mobile phone is slave. And that's what I use the terminology. In mobile communication, your mobile phone is smart, but it's a, it's a dumb or slave device. It has no negotiation. For example, base station says, let's talk plain text. Your mobile phone just talks plain text. It has no power to say that, let's use this encryption. It has no power. There, is, there are options, but the options are chosen by the base station only not the mobile phone. And that's still sim same in 5G as well. And again, this is due to the legacy systems or, or also some flexibility. So this is still, we have this problem. Then of course, then you have all the classical attack. You can have a bidding down attacks, asking 5G mobile phones, go back to 4G, go back to 3G, go back to 2G, because your mobile phone will be talking all those technologies, not only 5G. And, and how many people in the room really can know that? Do you, can you lock your mobile phone on 4G only? Have you tried this? Or do you know that there is a feature at least for you? Actually, you can, you can go on your mobile phone and check the mobile network settings. And there is an option, actually. You can select the network 4G, 3G, 2G, 4G, 3G, or 4G. But very few phones give you the option 4G only. But it also has a disadvantage. If you, if you put your phone on 4G only, if you go to some places, you will not get coverage, so you will be out of coverage, for example. You're not going to receive any calls. So that's the problem. So you have a bidding down attacks. You have a denial of service attacks. Then you have a tracking and interception as well. 
uh, uh, on the radio side, as long as you, uh, if you don't use proper encryption uh, methods as well. But in core network, that's increased attack surface. As I, as I said, we're going to use cloud security principles. We have virtualization security when we use hypervisors as well, and third-party API security, which is somewhat little bit complicated. And uh, and, and this, this way I explain you one scenario now, what exactly been happened and, and what this 5G, I just made a small use case to explain you the scenario. So assume this is the case of 2027, something like this, when full 5G is deployed. People start to use many devices which are being using base station and they are connected to the cloud-based core network. So this could be a data center uh, close to the uh, base station. This is what we call the edge cloud center in 5G. So it means that some of the building blocks can be, can be deployed onto this edge cloud where you no longer need a core network to be support. So this is also a scenario, something goes bad, uh, a city should, should, I mean, a city like Ghent should have its own mobile network and they should not rely on a central part of core network and you can have everything in edge. So this is one example. And uh, this is uh, uh, infrastructure which has been using hypervisor-based security. And then it creates a different slice. Slice means virtual machine, big size. So let's, let's put the, uh, abstract it's a virtual machine and then you have a different instance of those clouds and first cloud is for gaming services because 5g has the best use case that you can use vr based games with the 1 gbps speed and, and that's like for users so that's one cloud for only for those users one cloud for electricity let's say smart grid and uh, one is for operator vnf it means that is for normal mobile services so what this really means is basically when any mo any user on this left block wants to use mobile service so the base station decides which category of devices and they will offer the service through this one block so your traffic will be dedicated to different blocks of the cloud for example and similar way Many companies can buy those service blocks from mobile operators saying that, fine, I'm a car company. I want my all autonomous car data in a separate block. And this is the best use case for 5G as well. So you can have a dedicated service for autonomous cars. Every car using mobile network will have a traffic going through their own cloud, which will be quite separated. But now everybody's relying on the security of hypervisor basically there. And now you have to make sure that if something goes wrong with the hypervisors, data should not be leaked. And you need to give a guarantee that, okay, you need to have a segregation of traffic, uh, I mean, in a hardware level as well. And this is, this is quite, quite keep challenging for mobile operator. I mean, you can do for some entities, but how do you scale this aggregation? That's, that's the main problem with hypervisors as well. I mean, how do you scale those aggregation of traffic using hardware and software level techniques? And this is, this is a main problem actually. And that's what many people say, uh, it's, attack, it's a increasing attack surface. And, and the second thing I, I try to uh, give an example of uh, incident is basically, uh, how many people know this Greek wiretapping scandal? Yes, uh, very, okay, very few people know, okay. And I just, I just give an example because why, why this is important. So, th so this is basically, uh, it's called a tense affair. So what exactly this means? Every mobile company should have a lawful interface. It's called a law interface. And that means that your every mobile phone and SMS are being stored on this block, okay? This is mandatory for everybody. And nowadays we also have this infrastructure, but we have a dedicated machine or infrastructure or building which, which handles this part. But now in 5G, we, we may not know that this block will go in a cloud, cloud or somewhere, for example, where you have to rely on a separation something. But what happened in Greece actually back in 2007, I think, remember that time? So this has been developed by one vendor, and even I don't know, actually, I, I try to investigate what kind of operating system these blocks really run, what kind of uh, hardware software configuration they have, are they connected to internet or not. I tried to dig lots of information, but I couldn't find it. But in 2007, one country had a special malware for this kind of piece of machine. They did install malware on this machine. It was running flawlessly for six months. And what it was doing, it was tapping communication calls of almost some of the minister of Greece, Greek government, as well as prime minister of Greece. He was being live tap using this interface. And one cable was going to one embassy of country. And this was happening flawlessly for six months. Imagine 2007, they had this capability. Now we are thinking about having this kind of machines into a cloud. Okay, and you have to be really clear, sure that and trust that this will be, you will have a separate, similar kind of guarantee on those interfaces. And then this, re this really 
uh, tells you the problem or scope, what kind of telco blocks we need to handle when we think of uh, having co-network with, with virtualization uh, techniques as well. Yeah, so I skipped this one. Also, we have the problems of uh, co-network as well. This is also, I give one best example. So there was one company in Belgium who was doing pen testing uh, with some Belgian operator. And by mistake, some of the fuzzing packets came to Norway. Uh, because every mobile is, operators are being interconnected to each other. And the packet arrived to the Norwegian operator, and actually their HLR, the main center of system, or the main server of telco, got crash. And it took three days to recover it, only by not understanding few fuzzing packets. So the point is, we are talking about a telco network putting into some blocks, and, and we haven't been really taken care of lots of pen testing and infrastructure for different blocks, and this kind of problems uh, happens as well. And then we have a different incidents like Snowden. You, have, you already know that. So at least Snowden document says that they have a OTA keys, which means over their keys, and master key, which is KI, which is called SIM card. Because every SIM card has a main key, KI. If, if I got your KI key, it is possible until 3G and 4G I can decrypt your calls. In 5G, it may not be, because we improved some mechanisms there. But nowadays, we're relying on more on eSIM. How many people use iPad Air 2? Very few people. Do you use, uh, somebody use a smartwatch, I, I, iPhone, uh, Apple, Apple Watch, I, for Series 4, Series 5? So basically, you have embedded SIM card on your mobile phone. And do you know how do you change the mobile, mobile subscriber when you, use, uh, when you change the SIM card? Basically, future devices will have embedded SIM card, which you cannot take out, for example, right? And in this case, you will go to the operator saying that I wanted to change the subscription, and you will get a new operator. But what happened is actually your secret key, KI, will be transmitted over the air to your, to your SIM card. So it comes over the air using, using OTA keys, which is over the air key, for example. And as Snowden document already said that they had infrastructure. I mean, they already bypassed some OTA keys as well, for example. I mean, again, I'm not saying that it will be go, but again, we're relying on some key mechanisms and something, and this like a single source of and again, as a user, for me, I can't take out the SIM card. Or, or how can I ensure that, OK, it's, it's kind of a different problem with embedded SIM card. Uh, and denial of service attack, I skip. Uh, and, and now we talk about uh, radio side or uh, attacking radio protocols, especially on 4G. And that also affects 5G. And now we start with uh, uh, attacking radio side. Altaf will talk about the radio side. And then I will talk about the protocol, uh, authentication protocol vulnerabilities. Hey, it's going. It's on. Uh, okay. So you see that uh, you just learn about the threat landscape in 5G, and then you see that if we don't properly manage things, we have to go back in time, maybe the 90s or something. Like uh, so we started looking a bit more into the 5G radio protocol because that's where we are like. <laughs> We, we have like more expertise and then we start getting the hands dirty so uh, we found some they did some like fingerprinting attacks and man in the middle attacks on 5g protocol so let's let's go through that um, so we know that i think people are already aware of this term called uh, mc catchers so basically these are some devices in telecommunication networks that usually intercept conversations or uh, identities like mc which is the uh, permanent identity of your SIM card, then IMEIs. So basically, these identities are actually protected in 5G. So mm, they are never transmitted in plain text to the, to the network. So they're kind of safe. Uh, so we started looking a bit more uh, into the 5G protocols, like how can we actually track users, or how can we actually fingerprint devices and subscribers. So then we came across something called uh, capabilities. So every device or every modem like has certain capabilities uh, so when i mean capabilities i'm not talking about uh, the processor the android processor or the speed of the system so not this one but the the, cap the exact capabilities of the modem so basically these are defined in the standard and these are implemented by the baseband vendors into the modem so they program it and then they are like uh, somewhere around 500 MB or, uh, or 500 bytes of this information. Uh, it talks about like what kind of capabilities this device supports. There can be like two different types. The first one is like the core network capabilities, which talks about what kind of security algorithms is the device supporting. Does it support null algorithms or, or the normal traditional algorithms, which, which do like AES on 4G, or there are even better ones on 5G. So 
So what kind of algorithms? And then something like does the device support uh, voice calling facilities, SMS, data, then V2X capabilities which are coming up in the future. So these are some of the core network capabilities. Then the next one is the radio access capabilities. Just by the name, it says like something about the radio. So basically, it's about frequency bands, then what are the physical layer parameters, MAC parameters, then does it support MIMO, which is like multi-input, multi-output. So this is, these are like some new techniques to actually get high speeds on 4G and 5G. So, and then there is something called category. So, uh, let's say a new iPhone, like, like iPhone 11 has a Cat, Cat 18 or Cat 20. Uh, if you go back, then Samsung Galaxy S4 was a Cat 4 device. So, the higher the, the version of the, uh, the phone or the model, then the higher the category. So, so basically, like, these are some of the different capabilities. Uh, these are something 5G specific, like V2X. There is something called CIoT, which is like cellular IoT. Maybe if you have heard of uh, narrowband, narrowband IoT uh, or LTEM protocol. So these are something which, which are like devices coming up maybe in, in a couple of years. Uh, so these are some of the radio capabilities. I just took some traces from the Wireshark. So basically these capabilities are sent to the network when the device is registering to the network. So when you insert a SIM card, turn it on. So basically during the registration, we see that in the first step, there is the core network capabilities are sent to the network. Then authentication and security happens, which is mutual, so very good. Then the next one is like the radio capabilities are actually sent to the network. If you observe here closely, so all the capabilities are actually sent to the network, and then happens the security over the air, uh, which is in the bottom. And then these capabilities are actually saved at the network. I mean, we do not want to do the transmissions again, so we just want to optimize the network. So then there's registration success. So if you look here carefully, like these capabilities are actually uh, vulnerable to some passive and active attacks. So what kind of attacks? We'll see now. So basically the problem was um, you set up a rogue base station and you can actually access these capabilities without doing any kind of security and authentication. So you can just skip them, directly ask the device, just give me your capabilities, and then let's see what we can actually do. So we, we tried three different types of attacks. One was the MN map, uh, then a bidding down attack, then a battery drain attack, which is uh, specially dedicated for IoT devices. <laughs> So for this, we built a setup, so because like some of the attacks needed to be a man in the middle, it was not just a sufficient to be a, a, a rogue base station. So you have to be a man in the middle. So basically, you built a whole setup. Uh, like uh, here, we are using like two software radios. Basically, we stick to USRPs. You could also use other, maybe a bit cheaper versions like HackRF or uh, or Lime SDR. Uh, but these are quite stable. So, so basically, we built a rogue uh, E node B, which is nothing but a base station. Then rogue UE, which is nothing but the rogue the phone side. So both are connected together. And then whatever the messages that are coming from the victim UE. So in this case, I'm showing an iPhone, but it applies to all kinds of uh, devices which has which has any type of modem. So we are actually routing the traffic from the victim UE to the rogue E node B to the rogue UE and to the real network. So this is uh, so we use some parts of software from SRS LT. So we extensively try to modify them, just add the capabilities like whatever requires to be a man in the middle. Um, so there was a lot of uh, trouble playing with the timing of the messages. Like um, so it was uh, quite a bit of programming and then try to get this running. Um, so once we have this kind of setup, uh, the first one was uh, MN map. So this is nothing but uh, the mobile network mapping. So we we are like familiar with N map. So basically N map, what it does, it like try to find out live hosts on the network and then check what applications it's running and then what operating system, the version. So it tries to give us open ports and like, all this information. So we tried to do a similar thing on mobile networks. Um, so you try to operate a rogue base station, and then you just try to find out what kind of devices are surrounding you. So it could be a car, mobile phone, or an, an IoT device, or an iPad. So we try to distinguish each of them, and then try to find who is the maker, then the model, the operating system, then applications, and then the version, if possible. Uh, so this is the kind of tree that we built. So basically, we follow a tree style where we try to first identify the baseband, like who is the maker of this, then the model. If uh, then from that, like we try to identify if it's a cellular device, then if it's a cellular IoT device, then from that, is it a phone or is it another type of device? Or if it's a phone, then you could possibly do Android or iOS. I mean, we skip the rest of them. Uh, not much market there. So then there is Android, different types of Android, trying to distinguish what it is. 
then if it's an iOS, trying to find is it an iPhone uh, watch or an iPad. And then also, if possible, in some cases, like you could also get the version of the operating system. Um, then the other side, uh, we try to find if it's a car modem or if it's a railway modem. There are some techniques how you f uh, figure it out. Then you can also figure uh, like um, USB sticks, then routers, laptops. So we, we, we try to create a huge database that actually allows us to fingerprint all these different type of devices. On the other side, like on the IoT side, there are different uh, narrowband IoT, and then I mean these devices are not as popular as on the left ones, so we couldn't have enough information about the narrowband IoT device. But still, I think it's not a big big issue. Um, so okay, you might ask me like, okay, why is this identification of fingerprinting possible? Two reasons: because the baseband vendors like they they implement the capabilities differently, because it's not really mandatory to implement or to enable all these capabilities in the baseband. So some of them enable or some of them disable it. So there are some differences in that how you can actually use them to identify each baseband vendor. Then uh, the next one is each target application requires different set of. Uh, capabilities to be active. For example, if you take uh, a phone, I mean, obviously, you need the voice codec capabilities to be active. I mean, without that, you cannot make the voice calls. Or if you take uh, a USB stick, I think mostly we are using this for data purposes. So I think the voice capabilities would be off. And then the other capabilities which are required for data transmission are active. Or take something for an automated car you have this V2X capabilities always on. Or else the network doesn't know that this is a V2X device. So for this, we try to create, actually try to build a model first. We try to gather somewhere around like 70 to 80 devices, so like all kinds of phones, all kinds of uh, some cars, some devices from the military, some, some from the like USB sticks, laptops, iPads, some cars. Um, yeah, so a lot of devices and then try to uh, acquire the capabilities from them, just construct a huge model. So basically, when, when I'm saving these capabilities in, in the Wireshark, I try to um, like just put the name of it, what, what's the device, then who is the baseband, then what model it's running, or what model of the baseband it's running. I try to save it in this way. Uh, and from then, once I have this big model, and then I can actually try to go in the wild and then just collect random capabilities, compare with the model, and then uh, extract what kind of device this could be. For example, some fingerprints, I, I bring out some fingerprints here. To identify like specifically Qualcomm basements, you could uh, look for something called uh, EIA0. It's an integrity algorithm in 4G, and it's usually, it's an null integrity algorithm, and then it's always disabled in Qualcomm-based chipsets. And then the rest of them enable it. We don't know the specific reason. It could be that they could activate them dynamically when, when required. Uh, but like I think 90% uh, or 95% uh, of the devices from Qualcomm we see is like it's always disabled. If you take something from MediaTek, then they have this measurement capability which is always on, then the rest of them just disable it. So the thing is like it's not really mandatory to implement some of these capabilities. So with this you could use them and then try to identify what kind of device it could be. Um, so, did I skip? Okay, once you know uh, who is the baseband uh, maker of this, you just go on Wiki and then try to find out uh, from that particular model. You just click on one of these, it will give you like a list of devices that are actually using this processor or this particular baseband model. Uh, so once you have this, like you have list of supported devices, and then we want to fi identify like uh, what kind of application is this device running. So from that, okay, before that we have to split between IoT device and then like normal cellular device. So there are some specific capabilities which can actually distinguish both of them. Um, then we found certain specific capabilities that actually distinguish between phone and other type of devices, um, like codecs or uh, voice domain preference settings. Like these are something specific for phones. And phones always have them enabled. Um, some some like, Common fingerprints is like Huawei phones always use Huawei baseband, then Samsung devices use Samsung baseband. I mean, Samsung could also use a Qualcomm baseband, um, but there's a different way how you distinguish. Then Apple, you have only two choices, maybe one in the future. So uh, then this was a bit hard trying to differentiate Android and iOS devices. These are the only two capabilities that are related to, uh, to GPS. It's always enabled in Android devices. I don't know why Apple disabled it. I mean, there's no compulsion that you have to enable it. But, uh, but yeah, 
So this, we, we, it's good that you find some fingerprints and then you could use it for this detection. Um, I also have like other capabilities like that could be used for fingerprinting or like trying to find out the version. Maybe we could discuss it later. Um, so, but most importantly, like some things when you're doing fingerprinting is um, there are some issues. For example, uh, different SIM cards can actually SIM cards can play a key role. Different SIM cards can actually activate and deactivate certain capabilities. So this is the place where um, an attacker might actually get tricked, so that you might result in a false positive. Some sometimes, um, this is something to care about. Then. So uh, the important thing is like you try to build a model as big as possible um, that, that helps for a better detection or like that, that, that gives you like an accurate result in the end. Um, so it's not necessary that you have to operate at Oak Bay Station to actually get these capabilities. You can also do these things passively. Um, just because we are used to operating Oak Bay Stations, we just tried this way. Because like passive, it's possible because you saw that the capabilities are sent to the network before establishing any kind of security. So they are usually going in plain text. Um, you could actually link this capabilities to a particular IMC, maybe you also in 5G, um, then launch tar target specific attacks once you know the operating system. So it's, and then the nice thing what we are doing is like we are willing to share this kind of traces or the kind of big model that we have it, which automatically like uh, spits you out what kind of, uh, uh, the, the exact information that you need from the from the tool. Okay, so that was about the fingerprinting. Then we tried uh, the man in the middle attack with the bidding down. Um, so, like we saw in the during the registration procedure, where the capabilities are actually sent to the network before the OTA security over their security. So, being a man in the middle, what we try to do is like we try to modify these capabilities. Um, and then send it to the network, and the network actually saves all these capabilities at the core network. So next time when you are doing a transmission or sending a message again, the phone is actually not asking the device, or the network is not asking the device to resend its capabilities. It will just get it back from the core network and then reuse them. So if you manage to save fake capabilities over the core network, so until you actually restart your device, the, the base station is actually using fake or like modified capabilities of the device. So what kind of modifications we could do? We could just change the category. Like we just downgrade the category from, for example, like a CAT16 device, which is supposed to have a speed of like 300 or 400 Mbps. You just bring it to CAT1 device, which, ca which has like maximum speed of maybe 50. Or ev I mean, or if you're looking on a live network, it could be up to one Mbps, like real networks. Um, you disable uh, like specific parameters that can actually kill the speed, like the carrier aggregation, then MIMO. You actually remove the frequency bands, so which means that uh, you're not supporting uh, LTE-based frequencies. Then obviously, what happens is like if you, if you're traveling, so your device would be handed over to a 2G base station because you're obviously not supporting uh, LTE frequencies. Then you remove the voice over LTE uh, capabilities. Like these are the traditional way. This is the traditional way, like how you make voice calls on LTE, uh, which is much more secure than doing on a on a GSM-based network. Uh, if you remove like V2X capabilities, like it's not a car anymore, it's just a normal modem. So this is one of the trace from one of the operators and then uh, so just to show that the security mode command is actually happening after the capabilities are transferred to the network. Um, so we did some tests on live networks. Um, basically what we see here is like, like the voice calls are denied to the, to the phone, then the data rate is killed, then the handovers are actually being um, like over to the 2G or 3G networks. So basically what you're trying here is like in this, you're trying to attach a, a normal, like a, a, a 5G or a 4G phone to the network like an IoT device. So you're actually killing all its capabilities. So we tried over like 32 networks and then 22 of them are actually uh, using this kind of configuration where they ask the capabilities first and then do the security. So which has to change. And the the the, the success for the attack is like, because these capabilities are saved at the network, you're not doing the retransmission of them, so they are being used until you make a restart. So to just get, get over this attack, like the phone needs a restart. I mean, like imagine how many of us do a restart of our phone. Like, I think I did it two months ago or something, or, or automatically when the iOS updated, I think it did uh, restart it by itself. Um, so you might ask like, okay, why is this, 
uh, happening? Like, why, why is the standard allowing like to, to do to do this like security transactions before security? So the, the the simple reason we found in the standards was like this is for the optimization of the connection. But now it's a trade-off. Like, what would you choose? You would you choose this optimization or would you uh, prefer security over this? Um, then the third one, the similar kind of thing. Um, so here what we try to do is like we try to remove the, the power saving mode capabilities of in, in narrowband IoT devices. So basically these devices have this something called PSM. Um, so normally these IoT devices are like sending few kilobytes now and then maybe they, they, they don't have to do anything for the next one week. Uh, like in smart grids or smart meters. So they actually go off with this power saving mode uh, and then wake up after one week and then do the transmission of maybe one KB and then sleep again. So that's how they live for 10 years. So when you remove this kind of PSM capabilities from the device, you're actually keeping the device active, which is just draining its battery by doing signal measurements and everything. Um, and then you can actually drain the battery within like 13 days uh, and, you and you expect to run the device for 10 years. So. And the, the problem is also same, like, um, because like you need a restart to actually recover from this. So these are some of the three types of attacks we actually tried on this side and then uh, on the access network protocols. Then we also tried something on uh, um, locating and tracking people based on authentication protocol messages. Um, actually, Ravi would take over this. Okay, thank So the point is what we explained uh, all the attacks. All the attacks. Okay, so uh, all the attacks you mentioned, I just give an example of what it, what it means. If we fire up a base station here in this room, without looking at, even if your phones are in your packet and bag, we can tell exactly whether this guy is carrying an iPhone and which software version he's running. I can tell without looking at his phone or bag. I can also tell he's running, let's assume he's running a Samsung phone with Android 10, or, 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 or any, any version without looking at it. So it's, it's not like I'm really going into his device, but at least I'm getting some threat intelligence by without looking at it. So it's basically, it's quite important also is for, we can also get the IoT device information. So it's basically, you get some, some more information about the, uh, the devices. And what he explained, the battery drain attack as well, that was very important. And uh, when we discussed all this vulnerability with 3GPP who designed the protocol standard, and they said, uh, yeah, this makes sense, and, and, and we should uh, not ask this information without the authentication. Doesn't really make sense to request this information before this. And, and they fix those vulnerabilities in the standard, but this will take until one to two years until we'll get this in new, newer devices. So it will come, but it will come after uh, a few years. So this is one point, but this, this is important because uh, why we started to do this research, because in, in, uh, in 5G, we have done some improvements. And what is the improvement? I try to explain. So how many people know MC catchers? MC catchers or stingrays? So basically in 5G, they may not be usable at all. Because in 5G, we will not use MC in plain text. So if you fire up your MC catcher, which you bought for a million uh, euro or whatever it is from, uh, from any entity or any company, and if you run this, you will not be able to capture any 5G phone because there is no MC over there. So they will get failed as long as they're running on passive mode. Of course, even when you make an active attack and when you downgrade them to 4G and 3G, you will listen it, right? But now we're looking at actually what exactly more can be done on the protocol side. And uh, this is a few things. So MC Catcher works on this first block where they try to use MC. MC means the unique number which your SIM card has that identifies you as a person or a, or a device. And then, then we also had another problem with the challenge protocol, and this was uh, also partly our work uh, in 2012. And this was all known problems where 5G people know actually, right? And when the protocol was being designed, or uh, rethink, uh, I think 2017 something, that time discussion was going on. And then we, we went with, to them and they said, we found something else, do you want to look at it? Uh, that this could be also a problem for 5G if you don't fix it. So we're still leaving some scope that users will be get tracked. And what is this exactly? So what basically we're going to use uh, is a, called authentication material. I will explain what this authentic authentication material looks like. And then we use a fourth step of protocol, which is called re resynchronization attack. 
uh, and the first thing is with IMC in 5G it has been decided that they will they will no longer send IMC in plain text. Basically, you will have a, a PKI where you exchange the session and then you will send encrypted uh, IMC for user authentication. And this has been uh, good for at least IMC catches. Now, what we basically do, uh, so this is a quite complicated figure, but I explain in a normal way. So let's assume that I turn on my mobile phone. Okay, I power on this mobile phone. What happens that it's power on, it asks for the network, hey, I want to do authentication, okay? Network says, okay, fine, you want to, to use our services, let's authenticate. And it's quite obvious. Then network says, uh, okay, you want to authenticate, here I give you a challenge, because network wants to authenticate, and, and you know we need to have some kind of a challenge. So challenge consists of two bits, which is called random number and authentication token. Random number is just a random number, an authentication token, which consists of two values. I will come back to this. And these two values comes to phone, and phones verifies. So the phone algorithms, uh, there are some algorithms which are stored on your SIM card. They text those number, random number, calculate some computation, and they, they use this AUTN to create some value, and they send it back to the network saying that this is the challenge response, and uh, check whether it's correct or not. So network checks whether the response is the same, what he expects. If he say yes, okay, you're allowed to use services. If not, he will give you error message saying that there is a sync failure or there is a Mac failure. So reason because sync failure is saying that, okay, I know you are the right guy, but something is lacking. We are not synchronized. We, are, we haven't been synchronized each other well. Or if it's a Mac failure, it says that, no, this is not you, for example. So it's basically two kind of error message it gets. But what is interesting point is here basically now, so what we basically use is, this is RAND and AUT, and this is again plain text, and this also happens in 5G. So your MC is protected, but not RAND and uh, random number and AUT, and this is still goes plain text. And actually we use this material to, to identify a target now in 5G. And how do we use it? Because there is one, one thing which is missing there, or there was one uh, uh, mathematical issue uh, in, in the computation of that uh, thing. What was it exactly? So let's assume that the first block is basically a one mobile phone, and second is uh, a different mobile phone. So what happens on the first one? When you get AUTN, AUTN is basically consisting of your uh, Mac, for example, or, or uh, it has been protected with AK. So you, you have a Mac value, and uh, this has been protected with AK. AK belongs anonymity key, which means that your sequence number, what exactly you are using, is being protected with some anonymity key. So what is this sequence number is basically? What's the game of sequence number? So it makes sense that mobile phone, when you authenticates, it, it stores some sequence number. Let's assume that I authenticated with mobile network and, and my sequence number was 1000, okay? Next time, if somebody grabbed the same random number, AUTN, and replayed, because he's replaying the same sequence number of 1000, which has been already used by the SIM card. So SIM card says that this is a replay attack. So it says, no, I have used 1,000 sequence, uh, no longer being used. So you have to use 1,001 or 1,005, something like this. So this sequence number gets incrementally one, one plus one every time. And the same state from SIM card of your SIM card has been stored with mobile network operator server. So they are always with the same level of sequence number. So that's like a game here is basically. Now, what happens with the sequence number? Let's assume that this uh, one mobile phone is a sequence number uh, 1000, and this sequence number is protected with what you see this value here, C1. C1 is equal to sequence number XOR with AK. That's anonymity key, SK star, okay? And this is the sequence of 1000. Let's assume that this guy made 1000 calls and he's right now at 2000 sequence. The same mobile phone now. I replay as a fake base station, same random number, and AUTN to this guy. He will give a different response, having sequence number two, which is 2000, right? Which is 2000 XOR with the same key called AK, because this AK key is derived from a random number. It has no logic of sequence number. Because as an attacker, I'm playing the same random number to this mobile phone. He just takes the same random number, and, and he uses the same key. And if I XOR these two values, C1, XOR, C2, so basically sequence number one, XOR, sequence number two, and actually I cancel out straight ahead AK and AK due to XOR properties. Like a simple mathematical, mathematical issues that if you XOR those two values, you just cancel out the AK key. So basically you don't need to compute AK key, you cancel it out and you get this sequence number. And now challenge is I just need to use, uh, I just need to find out what exactly the sequence number bits are. 
And, and we did some uh, competition again, how do we identify a particular sequence number of a user? And, and we came to conclusion, actually, sequence number has a unique value per user, or per SIM card has a unique sequence number value. So let's assume that there is a sequence number of 1011, which, which, which belongs to 1000, for example, uh, which is identified only for Altaf. And actually, his phone will be in the same sequence number plus one. And when I check for other users, the same sequence number, it has the same value. So basically, even by looking at a sequence number, I can, I can say that this is my target, or this is my mobile phone, actually. So in 5G, we don't need to know EMC, but we can use this kind of vulnerability, which hasn't been fixed yet, to identify and track user. So no matter where you, you go to any area, you just fire up your fake base station, send the same random number and AUT, and, and you just know your target. Okay, right now this guy is sitting in this building, and we just fire up these uh, uh, pa packets from uh, any car, or any car, for example, or any MC catcher uh, vehicle. And you just get a response say, uh, like this. We discussed this vulnerability uh, to the vendors, uh, to the designers, and they said, yeah, we know there's a problem now, but now they said, this is okay, but this is a targeted attack. Uh, we agree because it's, it's not easy to fix this problem because, we have, because this is the same pro protocol mechanism has been used in 3G, 4G, and 5G. So it's really hard to fix or not, not easy to fix. And it's a targeted, targeted attack. So it will ha affect only few users, but not like mass level of users. So this hasn't been fixed yet but it's on ongoing stage for discussion. But the, the second vulnerability is fixed, what Altaf discussed, that all the security properties will be uh, asked only after the authentication. So this has been fixed uh, with uh, uh, mobile vendors. And this was also uh, GSMA, that's the mobile operator's body. They also have the uh, vulnerability disclosure program. So actually, even if you find any vulnerability of any mobile operator by playing uh, any uh, tool set like we do, so, so they, they actually, Listen to your vulnerability, they interact with mobile operators, so they, they become a one channel. So it's a, it's a good program started by GSMA too, if you have some findings on this learn. And uh, fixes for IoT devices will also come. Uh, UE capabilities has been uh, protected. The capabilities should be replayed, and this has been addressed. Uh, and going back to 5G, the overall 5G, it's also radio and core network. I tried to highlight some part of a core network. We haven't personally done research on core network because we don't have a platform or, or something to do research on, on how, how it will look like. Right now, we do have some implementation to play with 5G core network, for example, if some, some guys are interested. Like some French company called Amarisoft, they, they provide you some stack, which is not ready for, because the standard for 5G core network hasn't been fixed. So that's why you don't have a public stack. Uh, where you can really play around with how this, how this really uh, hypervisor uh, implementation really works or something like this. Or there are not many vendors who provide something like this. So we do have a better security in 5G, so far at least by looking at the standard, what we know. Uh, new features, but also increased uh, attack surface. At the same time, legacy systems are as well there. So you still have a problem that somebody can f ask you to fall back to the 4G networks, and you still have those attacks. Uh, and as well, we need, need, to, need to have the best security practices when it comes to the config in cloud. And my assumption is, or at least what we say, when we have a new technology like 5G, the core network, of course, it, it takes some time to become mature, right? When you have a new technology, it takes time to be, get understand the configuration, to deploy the services. So we may have some problems in early years with 5G core network as well. But time to time, it may get better uh, the way we follow the best security practices in this. And uh, I end on this note. Uh, so there's a report from uh, a NATO Alliance. This is the NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence. They have a really nice article on uh, the controversy going on 5G security or uh, 5G 5G, China, and Hawaii. It's an article name, actually. And that has one really nice quote, what you read there. So 5G as an emergence signaling, signal intelligence platform. And why it's important, this is what I told you, in after 10 years, when we use 5G for every IoT device, every car, uh, and also 5G is also planning to use low, low latency, sorry, no, no, not low latency, see so this uh, LEO satellite. Uh, so they also have a plan to use that also access medium, for example. So, so assuming that we are going that area, so even though you have an end-to-end -end application security, you still leave some traces with telemetry data. And the telemetry data means signaling data. So that reveals some information about a user, about the device, and what kind of applications. Not the end data, but you still get the telemetry data. So many people see 5G as a threat in, in terms of that. And this is also quite uh, interesting from surveillance point of view for 5G. And on this end, I, I, uh, we 
conclude our presentation. And if you have any questions, we are free to talk now. Any question? I think we do have three minutes. One or two. Yeah, one or two. Um, these are actually two questions. When you talk about the hypervisor and trusting on the hypervisor, does that pose any change of risk posture on what we're currently doing on migrating business processes and data to the cloud because we're already trusting hypervisors in the cloud and there's a lot of programs doing research on security of hypervisors and as you just said, that is being constantly uh, improved. <coughs> and the second question is, <clears throat> for 5G networks, is there any special consideration that we should have in terms of who the vendor should be and whether somebody should control like the core part of the 5G network as opposed to the core part of the 4G. Like, this goes back to the China thing mm. that you were just talking about. Yeah, the first question about hypervisor is, uh, it's true that we are already using that. It's not really new technology. Only the problem is the deployment. Uh, deployment and trust. So basically, when, as a mobile operator, when I buy this infrastructure, whether I build my own data center to, to install those stack, or I will just buy from a vendor, and then, be, then it becomes a problem of trust, right? And this is the main challenging with hypervisor, and that's what the problem is. Let's assume that I, I buy all this core network from, uh, from China or Hawaii, for example, right? Or uh, will I ask Hawaii to build data center as well for me or not? And then I run all the stack on this cloud and hypervisor. And hypervisor doesn't end, the, end there, for example. In order to configure all these settings, you need to give a different access to different entities, right? And now, how do you maintain the trust between different third parties who are also accessing the same hypervisor for, for protection, for adding firewalls, and many things like, many things like this? So that becomes a trust issue. Okay. So how do you really manage the trust? That's the, that's the biggest problem for mobile operator. Because right now with mobile operators, until 4G, they have the full control over the system. Right, and, and this may shift some change here and there. Again, some operators will really do uh, strategically, or if they have resources, they can do. But some operators will just rely on the vendor. So just give me everything, and I will just use the whatever you gave me. Because they don't have the manpower or resources to build their own infrastructure. Right. For example, like a cloud, edge cloud or something like this. And the second point is it's, it's quite controversial. Again, it's depending on the uh, uh, policy of organization, how they do it. But as many people say, multi-vendor uh, deployment is the best strategy, what they say. And that has been uh, uh, mentioned by the UK government as well. And some government also planning similarly. Like, for example, you buy a core network from a trusted entity, which you trust most, for example, one vendor. But you can also take some base stations from some other vendors, some from other vendors. So you just have a diversity of your network. So you don't rely on one vendor for everything. And strategically, you, you build your blocks where you have a control over the, uh, some, some blocks. It's like a strategy of the way you do it. But again, this is complicated because uh, Ericsson, not 100% all the Ericsson uh, uh, software and hardware will speak to the Huawei software because every, everybody has a different specification. So by standard, it doesn't really work flawlessly. So you still have some caveats there, here and there. So there are some pains for operators when you use multi-vendor, but those has to be reduced, for example. Yeah? Okay, uh, so we have a leak of time. Okay, all right. So guys, thank you for incredible speech. Okay. And uh, yeah.